I'm Morgan McGuire, and I'm presenting a collaboration with Julie Dorsey, Eric Haynes, John Hughes, Steve Marshner, Matt Farr, and Peter Shirley on a taxonomy of bidirectional scattering distribution function lobes for rendering engineers. With the word engineer, we intend to include researchers, faculty, and students, the people who design rendering systems and build them. But that's different from the scientists and engineers in adjacent fields, people in manufacturing, and content creators who have different needs and are going to have their own taxonomies for which ours might not be appropriate. Several months ago, Pete gathered us all online. He noted that there's a lack of consistency in the terminology that we use to describe materials in computer graphics rendering. He proposed that we standardize for our own future textbook editions for our courses and papers and reduce that confusion. So we surveyed the major work across several fields in five decades, and we sought to find a, a reasonable set of terms and concepts for materials. The first challenge we noted is that material has many different meanings in the field of computer graphics and interactive techniques when it's taken as a whole. A material could describe the properties of physical simulation, including density and chemical properties, friction coefficients, and rigidity. It could be an audio material, which includes the sounds that an object makes when it, it's struck with different materials. A uh, material could be a modeling material, which includes shape and detail features like fur and tiles and bumps. Um, for many of us, surface rendering for the outermost surface is what we care about. Or maybe we mean multiple thin layers of the surface is the material, but that can include emission as well as light reflection. Uh, there's also the, the process of volumetric rendering for things like fog, and that includes phase functions in the material. And then if you went to a gameplay designer, um, they would say that in the game logic, the material includes properties like, can this object be picked up by the player? Is it breakable? Can it be traversed by a non-player character? So there are many, many definitions of material. They all include an overlapping set of properties, and they get tagged on objects. But it wasn't something we could usefully build a taxonomy for our purposes. So this is a problem. And to illustrate it, let me show you, uh, if you have a sphere with a particular material on it, I personally picture something like this, where the, the color and the size of the highlight uh, are sort of the space of variation in material. But that, that's what a sphere looks like with a, a, a red rubber material, maybe. But to an artist who's using a tool like Substance Designer, um, that artist might say, these are all the same geometry, the same object. It's a sphere, but they have different materials. And coming at this first from a rendering perspective, I hadn't thought about, for example, in that second example, the coverage mask uh, in the wicker example being part of the material. But that, that sort of makes sense, although I like to think of it as that's the absence of any material. Um, but that the material might include the displacement map, or if we look at that, that final sphere, it looks a little bit like a globe. Um, that actually has individual procedurally generated sailboats and houses inside of what it's considering the material on the sphere. And to me, that, that's clearly into the realm of geometry. And so obviously, throughout our field, people really disagree on, on what exactly is material. So we decided to address this by narrowing our goal from uh, describing materials to describing appearance under thin surface rendering at the level of uniform small patches within a pixel or texel. And yet, we still found the terminology for appearance to be inconsistent. I think probably the most common definition problem in all of rendering is, what does specular mean? And to some people, that's a surface that creates a perfectly sharp mirror reflection. And to others, it's a surface with mirror reflection or refracted transmission. Uh, and then to, to many others, it's, it's any blurred reflection that's going to be sort of near or driven by the mirror reflection direction. Um, so those are very different definitions. And of course, if you then went to, say, vendors of uh, paint and metal and cloth, or to optical physicists, to natural media artists, to CGI artists, to game programmers, to VFX engineers, academic researchers, uh, all these groups have different words for describing the appearance of something like this shiny statue, um, even when they're just talking about appearance. We're not even trying to categorize material anymore. And furthermore, we recognize that we really can't discuss appearance as a property of an object anyway. Um, and that's because the passive appearance of an object results from many factors. There's the combination of the two media, one on either side of the surface where light is scattering. So this includes air in this cartoon. Um, the incident illumination conditions, the imaging system has different sensitivities, such as a camera sensor or a human retina will affect appearance. And then the context uh, within the image, so things like light adaptation, bloom, and local contrast, both in space and time, uh, all those happen in the human visual system, and they happen in modern cameras and computer graphics cameras as well. And when I say passive appearance, I just mean the object isn't emitting light itself. That's a, that's a whole other issue. Um, so our conclusion from that thought process was to actually abandon trying to define materials and appearance at all um, and focus on something else. So appearance is the result of shading. We're better served in rendering by describing the key actor in shading which is the bidirectional scattering distribution function, which is abbreviated BSDF. 
And that's not a property of an object, actually. It's an emergent property of an interface between two optically homogeneous media. Um, in practice, it is common, though, to assume that the surfaces will be in air and to attach a BSDF to specific geometry or to an object. But we, we want to recognize that that's not true in the general case. That the BSDF will change with the surrounding medium. So here's what the BSDF is. Um, it's going to be a function of the incoming and outgoing direction vectors at a surface. It's the ratio of change in outgoing radiance to the change in incident radiance over small solid angles. It has units of per steradian, and this means that the BSDF is a distribution of light scattering in every possible direction. So numerator radiance, denominator ear radiance. And if I choose some incoming direction of light, then I could visualize a cross section of the BSDF in 2D with a cartoon like this. The gray box is going to be a medium, such as glass, and the top of the box will be the interface between air and that glass. And let's, to make this interesting, say that the glass is, is rough. It's going to be ground glass, sound, sandblasted. The blue arrow is the incoming direction of propagation of the light that I've chosen. And this normally would vary over um, a theta and, and a phi or over x, y, z. So it's two degrees of freedom. I'm fixing it for the picture. And then here's the distribution of scattered outgoing light. And for the ground glass, there's probably a lot of reflection around the mirror direction, but a fair bit that scatters in every direction. And then there'll be some that propagates forward into the glass by transmission, but it'll, it'll be diffused by that rough surface, which is why if you have rough sandblasted glass, it provides some privacy and like a, a shower door by blurring what's seen through it. So in order to draw this, again, I had to fix both degrees of freedom for the incoming vector and then one degree of freedom for the outgoing vector. And that left only the outgoing angle on the plane of the screen that I had to, to graph relative to. If I chose the incoming direction differently or a different orientation for the diagram, then we'll see a different distribution. So if I maybe look at that direction, I get different distribution, different distribution. Um, now, in practice, a rendering system mainly uses a BSDF in two ways. And I'll illustrate those with sort of toy renderer pseudocode. On the left here, you can see code that evaluates the BSDF function for direct illumination. This is what happens in a rasterization pixel shader or an array hit shader. This is what everyone spent a lot of time on in the early 80s. Um, systems using rasterization continue to spend most of their computation time on that until recently. But what's more important today and going forward is on the right, there's the, this is the code for a mock path tracer. Um, that's a Monte Carlo renderer. And it's going to sample directions, sample the outgoing light directions with a probability distribution that's proportional to the BSDF. And in practice, if you're doing a good job, it should be proportional to some other things too, like maybe the cosine of the angle of incidence and, and the incoming light distribution. Um, but at the very least, you're going to care about this BSDF as a distribution. And sampling is where the computational research emphasis today is for offline rendering. And increasingly, that's also the case for game rendering with real-time ray tracing and stochastic methods. And the sampling use case is also the primary motivation for today's talk, as we'll see in a moment. Unfortunately, the BSDF terminology in the literature isn't much better than the appearance terminology. In fact, it's, it's mostly the same terminology. So it seems like we haven't made much progress, but now we're, we're actually at the point where now we can make a contribution. Now we can introduce a taxonomy. And in order to come up with the taxonomy, it's important to first step back and ask, why do you want to name things? Why do we want to distinguish cases? Because it's, it's an interesting theoretical and intellectual exercise, um, but it's hard to get an objective place to distinguish between cases if we, we can't first articulate why we're trying to do that. And, and this is, I think, one of the key insights in, in our work uh, as a process. And this is why I think we're, we're going to have some success with our taxonomy. Um, we notice that when we are creating code or algorithms, we have procedures, methods, functions, we need to name them when we use and implement BSDFs uh, in different ways. And we, we notice that we sort of factor the code itself into different helper functions. And so let's look at why we make those separate functions and the separate classifications, and that will justify branches of the taxonomy. When a renderer is sampling a BSDF, it has to handle light scattering differently, depending on whether it's described by a discrete or a continuous probability distribution function. On the right, we're showing a schematic of a PDF probability distribution function for a surface that always produces a discrete set of light rays from one incident light ray. So for example, a perfect mirror. And then there are some photographs shown of interfaces between glass, um, very shiny metal, or water and air that could be approximated by such a BSDF. Now, the BSDF for a mirror reflector isn't a function in the mathematical sense that we're used to. For every input, it evaluates to either 0 or infinity. 
Consider that in the context of our two main use cases for BSDF, evaluation for direct illumination or sampling for Monte Carlo ray tracing methods. It is not useful to evaluate the mirror reflector BSDF for direct illumination. The result will either be infinity, which we can't use for shading, and that's only going to occur for a single direction, and thus with zero probability anyway, or the value is zero because we're not at the impulse direction, and so there was nothing to compute if the answer is zero. And so in either case, it, it, it's not of any use. So we'd like to classify such BSDFs so that we can branch in the code and exclude them from direct illumination shading. Now for the sampling use case, when we have this kind of distribution, we need to employ discrete, which is probability mass sampling algorithms, instead of continuous probability density sampling algorithms. And so we, once again, require a code branch. This is the implication of Monte Carlo for the taxonomy that I promised you two slides ago. So this branch point in the code where between continuous and discrete, we implement the, the actual method in our code differently, that creates a branch point in the taxonomy. We need to have names for those branches to refer to that part of the algorithm. For the case where the single incident light ray produces a continuous distribution on the left, we can further subdivide the scenarios, and that's again going to be driven by the Monte Carlo considerations. Outgoing rays that are sampled proportional to a continuous distribution can either be clustered together and probably highly influenced by a particular outgoing direction, or they could be spread out widely over many directions. When the rays are clustered together, that creates a very coherent ray cast, and that encourages certain kinds of data structures and scheduling operations for parallel processing that computes the ray intersections. Monte Carlo's use, renderers use stochastic samples, and that produces noise in the final image because of the, the randomness of the low discrepancy sequence. And so a common step in rendering is denoising by blurring together the contributions of nearby samples in an image or samples from previous frames that we expect should have had similar values and because the Monte Carlo process diverged. When denoising animation, knowing that the outgoing rays are clustered together tells us that we should not blur too far in screen space. Knowing whether retroreflection, transmission, or the mirror vector most strongly influences the BSDF shape also tells us how to blur contributions from the previous frame into the current one. For the case of rays that are spread widely, we need a very large denoising kernel since there'll be a lot of noise, but it also tells us that we can reproject samples directly on the surface as they're less dependent on the view direction. And finally, we can do further divide the spread out case. When the relevant distribution is uniform over the hemisphere, that's a special case that allows pre-integration as the incoming direction is irrelevant. We can also perfectly reproject during denoising. The remainder of the spread out case is everything else. It has no special properties to exploit. It also avoids the singularity of the mirror case, so it must be handled in a fully generic way. Now, most of the time we can't describe a BSDF using just one of these categories. Instead, the shape of the BSDF is expressible as a sum of these. So measured or simulated BSDFs can be projected onto these terms as a kind of basis space, um, because one category is everything else, there, there's not going to be any error in approximation by doing so. And so we decompose into the, a sum of lobes. If you have an artistic or a fitted analytic BSDF that's already been separated into weighted terms by construction. And so all that's left is just to name the different shapes that appear in your functional decomposition diagram. So the space of all composable BSDF lobes, when we have to branch on the sampling implementation, we name the perfect mirror and related cases impulse or perfectly specular, and we name everything else finite valued. When we have to branch on lobe orientation for clustered together uh, distribution, we say it's retroreflective if it's strongly influenced by the incident direction, glossy if it's strongly influenced by the mirror direction and the refraction direction, and we call everything else diffuse. And finally, when we have to have different pre-integration strategies, we call Lambertian or perfectly diffuse the view-independent constant BSDF case, and then everything else is just general diffuse, which is subsumed by the diffuse category. Here's a list of all the terms that we specifically defined in the paper. You can refer to the paper for those. The paper also contains sort of Rosetta Stone relating our terms to previous terminology that's popular across adjacent fields. So in summary, we hope everyone will adopt and extend our taxonomy, but at least for ourselves, now we can have consistent uh, terms in our libraries, our textbooks, publications, and courses. The methodology that we arrived at is one that I'll now use for creating terminologies and taxonomies in general, um, which is define the input, not the output, uh, distinguish where there's an implementation difference, and that's where you put the branches, reuse terminology that's already in use, but retroactively define it so that it's now clear and unambiguous.
We really encourage further work on standardization to make interdisciplinary communication more effective and to make graphics more accessible to newcomers. Thank you very much.